Thank you for being with us. We're discussing today COVID-19, the opening of the airports and the consequences. What are we going to expect? With me, if you're just joining us, Professor Mark Brinkard, Mr. Warren Zara, and uh, linking up by Skype is Shadow Minister of Health, the Honourable Dr. Stephen Spiteri. Good evening, Dr. Spiteri. Good evening. Hi to Professor Brunkat and Mr. Zara. Good evening. Good evening. Um, how, how, I hope you're well. What are your thoughts on this new stage of, of the pandemic? Basically, uh, we're in a stage right now of containment in terms of uh, the frontiers and the airports, the ports uh, that are closed. And so we are in a state where basically we are contained in terms of people who can come over into our country and possibly infect us with the virus or introduce uh, a viral infection. However, as we're seeing uh, all around Europe, as the frontiers are opening up and airports are uh, instead of being closed down, being open to tourists and whoever is traveling, we are seeing an increased uh, rate and a rise in infections and cases of COVID-19. Uh, this is going to be expected uh, in our islands as our, our airports are going to be opened very soon. And we have to be on the alert and possibly uh, stay uh, quite uh, on the on the uh, edge to see if our numbers are going to increase because this might affect our local transmission and possibly our infection rate mm -hmm. right now our r factor which is most commonly interpreted as the number which uh, dictates how we are doing in terms of the viral infection is below one however if this rises uh, to a certain extent where we see it uh, going up or we see a trend of the infections going upwards, we have to be on the alert as this might cause uh, a, an increased uh, rate of admissions into our hospitals, an increased rate of uh, morbidity and even mortality. But uh, coming back to you, uh, Mr. Zar, it would be disastrous if we had to have a second lockdown, wouldn't it? I, I, I believe so, yes. yes. I, it's, it's something that we have to avoid at all costs. Um, we have to, as I said, the gradual reopening has started in respect to the number of flights coming in. I think that was very cautious and it allows us to see the next six to eight weeks, how things develop, and uh, one has to take it step by step. The important thing is we have to start somewhere mm -hmm. and we have to start living our lives as normally as possible. Absolutely. Dr. Spiteri. Dr. Sp so basically I can understand uh, in terms of tourism, economy and uh, whatever affects our country, which uh, I'm into and I can uh, agree with, with some of the statements which are being said. However, health issues uh, should be a priority uh, in, in our country. Um, we have to be on the alert for contact tracing because uh, as, as we can see, the tourists who are coming into Malta are not going to be screened. Um, for the virus. So basically, we are going back to the stage prior to 7th March, when we had the first case. And this might uh, influence our infection rate and possibly causes an increase in number. We have to remember that we are a densely populated country. We are a country which, uh, in terms of numbers, we can contain, as we did, with the adequate uh, factors uh, required. However, if we allow that the viral uh, load increases in terms of infection rate, we could end up with some serious consequences. Mm -hmm. Personally, your personal opinion, uh, Dr. Spiteri, do you actually um, have uh, some recommendations, uh, perhaps something 
that uh, I, I you mean, believe we, we, could we, be we better? We should strike a balance. Basically, our economy is very important for the country, but uh, health issues are a priority. So basically, we have to uh, continue educating our, our people so that uh, we avoid uh, a lot of crowding. Uh, we have to uh, prioritize uh, basic hygiene mechanisms. We have to uh, also try to advise in terms of uh, contacts with possible uh, positive patients, even those who are coming from abroad, so that uh, we, we try to contain as much as possible uh, the infection rate. Because as I'm saying, uh, if we take everything for granted, that could be uh, quite a major health issue, which could eventually influence uh, our economy at the end of the day. Professor Brinkert. Well, as we suggested earlier, in countries which have this high R factor that the hospital was referring to, I still recommend we test people before they board with the simple pregnancy-like kits, which are not very expensive and can be done very quickly. What we need is specially trained staff, sort of first aiders, basically, and I think this is feasible because... But well, how, do, how do we get this implemented if, well, if it's a recommendation? I, I, as, as Mr. Zara has just said, we're talking about maybe 600 tourists coming every day, you know, and we test far more than that in Malta, you know. So if we have good first aiders who are trained at taking pinpricks on two different cartridges, one for antibodies and one for the virus, then at least we can screen about 85% of the positive ones, remembering that most of the young, healthy tourists coming over can be asymptomatic carriers. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if somebody is ill, has got gastroenteritis, can't sneeze, can't smell or taste, has got a temperature and so on, those are obvious. They'll self-select themselves. The problem are these asymptomatic carriers who might be carrying a strain of virus that we are not used to. Um, and these will only be coming from countries where there's a high infection rate, and then you might get a super spreader. But I'm all for testing before they board, and once they're here, being more relaxed about it. And I'm really quite relaxed once they're over because mm. if people become symptomatic here, you know, then you can, we can test them in the usual way that our excellent Department of Pathology and Virology and Public Health have been doing. But I'd rather stop them before they board rather than have them after they board and give them confidence. After all, I'm happy when I'm screened for guns or screened for weapons. Or, you know, nowadays, it's become part, of, part and parcel of traveling. Mm -hmm. used to, we never used to do this. But now we are happy. We go through, we test ourselves. And this should be also part of the protocol, a simple test, while the crisis lasts anyway. Mm -hmm. Dr. Spiteri, do you agree with, uh, with what Professor Brinkart is saying? Yes, basically Professor Brinkart is um, telling us that screening is important. I fully agree. We should have basically a protocol because it's, it's very important that we screen these tourists or whoever is coming over to Malta prior to boarding because otherwise uh, getting over these, these tourists, these individuals, uh, having a flight coming over to Malta and then testing positive once they land in Malta, it's, it's useless and nonsense because they could be infective even on the, on the airplane. So basically there should be a protocol. This should be on a national and international level so that we try to avoid uh, basically contamination uh, in various countries. As I said prior, uh, we are seeing an increased rate. Today, the WHO has said that there is an increased rate all over Europe once the borders have been lifted. We know what's happening in other countries who ex experienced the first wave a uh, long time ago in terms of uh, months. Uh, and now they are experiencing a second wave, which is quite on the high side. Thank you very much, Dr. Espiteri. Thank you very much. I wish you a good evening. Thank you. Your comments, Mr. Zara. How can we give people confidence and local people? Local people visit hotels, visit restaurants. Now, once they know that the borders are opening and we're accepting tourists from abroad, we don't want to stop them, stop Maltese people going out and enjoying the summer. Absolutely not. And I still, uh, I, I believe, as I said, that the stakeholders in the industry, be they hotels, restaurants, bars, despite the pressure that that puts on establishments, even financially, have, 
I have seen physically myself being very responsible and respected the orders, requirements, and protocols that have been suggested for the, uh, mm -hmm. for the industry to take on board. So I think in terms of going out and enjoying yourself and, uh, uh, and enjoying the facilities of a hotel or a restaurant, etc., I feel very confident that things have been done correctly. Now, when you come to the 1st of July and the opening of the airport, remember, it's 27% of what we normally yeah. are receiving, and that is not throughout July, that is only in the second part. Now, that means with load factors of aircraft, I do not expect that every flight is going to turn up 100% full. So you may have uh, even less numbers coming in than expected. Mm. And if the protocols within the establishments are being operated correctly, which I believe they are, yes. uh, then uh, the social distancing aspects and it will, will take place. Sure. A question, uh, Professor Brinkart. Is it mandatory to wear masks on the aeroplane? Uh, yes. yes, yes, it is. I just want to reiterate what, what Warren is here saying. I do agree with him. Uh, uh, that, that the, the, the uh, protocols are being adhered to. The same applies for hairdressers, restaurants, and hotels. I think it's almost safer going to a restaurant or an hotel than congregating on a beach, for example, you know, especially, especially if, you're, uh, if, you're, uh, if you happen to belong to a vulnerable group because the, the restaurants have really gone to town on, on, their, on their... I have to say, my experience uh, in the restaurants so since yes. and the hairdressers, yes. people yes. are very vigilant. Yes. I, I have to well, take my yes. hat off yeah. to the Maltese, it, I think. Com it, yeah. comes, yes. it comes naturally because at the end of the day, all the, all the people who are in the industry mm -hmm. have gone through three or four months now of not yeah. having <laughs> any visitors yeah. coming. Yes. That's... that's and, and the last thing that we want is to mm -hmm. bend the rules and then end and up risk. having yeah. risk. So mm -hmm. people will be responsible mm -hmm. by virtue of the nature yeah. of, their, of, of their business. Absolutely. Yeah. You, look after, you look after mm -hmm. your future. You have to be careful and avoid these pikes. And uh, people here are cooperating. There's been a massive... Uh, amount of cooperation yes, here, yes. which is second to none, really. I'm very impressed, actually. Public health regulations. I'm very uh, impressed. Yeah. We're joined we now by um, to talk to bring us up to date with the stock markets by Nick Glinsman, who is actually in lockdown in Brazil, one of the places <laughs> that's been hit so badly. Hi, Nick. Yes. Hi How there, are Leah. you? I'm, How are you? I have to say, I was just listening in. I would love to go for a haircut. Oh, I think your hair looks lovely, Nick. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, an update about COVID in Brazil. I mean, we keep reading about Brazil all the time. Well, it's interesting because what, we've, what we're seeing is a combination of COVID and also dengue. And uh, dengue is more of a concern for us where we are outside of Sao Paulo. Um, COVID, as I said the last time I was on, I think COVID, where you're seeing it really build is in the, the favelas, the slums, because of the tightly packed cohabitation um, and also the lack of, pro, to be blunt, the lack of hygiene. You know, sanitation isn't at its best there. Um, and I think that's where it, it's prevalent. Plus also... You know, I go back to what happened in the uh, Lombardy area of Italy. You have in the big cities still have very high levels of pollution. Mm -hmm. And that's also a negative in terms of improving the outlook for COVID. So I think that's a problem. I think the health system for those that can't afford private health care is under stress and probably can't cope as well as one would hope and one would expect to see it, for example, in the developed world. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you give us an update on the global stock markets? Are we well, going to Well, today's an interesting day. Um, I think what's happened is, look, sentiment's driving a lot of things, and sentiment is being driven by a political desire. So, you know, there's shock and horror at some of the data coming out of the U.S. states that have been had opened up earlier. 
And I think what, you, what we're seeing is people in the stock market, particularly in the U.S. right now, uh, selling on Friday, knowing that they can always buy back on Monday, but not wanting to take the risk for perceived worse data. Now, that data we're seeing is focusing on cases rather than deaths. There is a time lag, and we want to see what's going on with the deaths, which are still declining, funnily enough. Um, but that's not the conventional narrative that people want to focus on at the moment for political purposes. Now, in terms of globally and the markets in general, I still maintain the fact that you will see, particularly in the U.S. and the, those countries outside of the EU with their own fusion of monetary and fiscal policy flexibility, there's still a lot of ability to increase the help. And they, in fact, we're going to see before August the 1st, one to two trillion dollars more fiscal help in the U.S. Um, and I think that's, you know, you're seeing also countries such as the U.K. talking about cutting VAT to boost the consumer directly, VAT being a regressive tax rather than progressive. And my view is that what we're going to see going forward is probably the U.S. outperformed the European Union, primarily because you have a situation where they have a very flexible no limits, monetary fiscal policy mix. And the Federal Reserve itself has only done enough to what they've defined as stabilize the financial markets, the third, the third part of their mandate. And I've, you know, I've seen some quotes from the likes of Loretta Mester, we have a lot more in the bag if and when necessary. But I think they're waiting for the next fiscal move from Congress. And you're already seeing Mnuchin and Powell discussing that with the likes of Pelosi, what the size is. I think the size will possibly depend on the next week's unemployment data out of the U.S., which was a very big positive surprise on its last release. So a bit of disappointment there. You'll see a bigger number. Uh, another positive surprise may be a lesser number, but I didn't see less than one trillion. And then I think that generally what we've seen, and I think this will continue for a while, is if you look at the US and some of the anglo spheric countries like the UK, they're very orientated towards technology and services. So during the lockdown, there was less of a hit versus the more industrial supply chain dependent manufacturing countries like Germany, and for that matter, for the EU generally. Thank you, so, Nick. So Thank you. I think that continues, okay? Thank you very much, Nick, for today. Thank you. We're always short of time. To conclude, Professor Brinkart. Uh, two points which involve Brazil, funny enough. One, yes. one and, and the comments. We're always short of time, as you yes, notice. Right. One, death rate is coming down simply because we're getting better at treating the disease and maybe our immunity is better. Secondly, um, Secondly, we have invested 700,000 euros in a, in a vaccine. Uh, Mr. Fern and uh, Dr. Fern announced this recently in a vaccine that's not ready yet, which is the Oxford one, which is a, a very good one. It should be available around about September, October. Oddly enough, they've run out of patients to test. And the number of vaccine companies now, there are 124 in development, 10 are front runners, are heading down to Brazil to conduct their phase three trials in Brazil itself. Um, because that's where there are enough patients to be able to conclude as to whether which vaccines are the best. Yes, um, and and, and Oxford has done this as well. So they're there, um, tested the vaccine. Vaccine is available to the Brazilians. It's very safe. Now it's phase three. And this will enable us to get vaccines on the market much quicker than would otherwise have been the case. I mean, what I can see with this, Mr. Zara, that it's brought the whole world to sort of work together, hasn't it? Yeah. Definitely. Mm. Yes, I mean, that's, that's a positive thing out mm. of something that's been quite horrific. To conclude and give a message to the public on behalf of the hospitality industry. Well, I believe that locally the management of COVID through the medical authorities uh, throughout this situation have communicated fantastically, managed the situation more than I could ever uh, have imagined and so that gives you a lot of confidence in the local infrastructure where the medical side comes in. Um, the hospitality industry is very important for the island 
and I believe the gradual reopening will allow us to see and manage any uh, hotspots that we need to tackle. Yes. And it won't overwhelm us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're in good hands. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much for joining us once again. I'll be with you next week. I thank my guests, Professor Brinkart, Mr. Zara, Professor Lawrence, Christian Hunt, and Nick Glinsman. See you next week. Have a lovely weekend.